You got your Mag and Mac guys, McMullen and McDonald here on Birds 365, and we are joined by Burke Cabina from The Athletic, who I was lucky enough to be able to talk to on Sunday prior to the game when he was on me with my other Mac partner, Glenn Mac, now on WIP. And uh, none of us were really overly optimistic coming into the game against the Bucks on Sunday. You might maybe a little less pessimistic than me or Mac now. Um, it was a spit show, if you get my drift. Mm, um, yeah. What the hell happened? What, what what was it? We always talk about the perfect storm coming together. I don't know that there could be any less perfect storm that came together Monday night in Tampa. What what to you was the biggest thing that just stuck out? And you go, oh, my God, they stink. They couldn't tackle. I mean, yeah. the team forgot how to tackle. You have people just running right over the middle and then running right through defenders. No one's going to win when you do that. Um, I mean, the second thing that stuck out to me was that the Eagles were only down 16-9 to nine at halftime, and they had three shots coming out of the second half, one, two, three, and then safety. Game's pretty much over at that point because there wasn't much confidence that the offense was going to score another touchdown, much less two. Um, so it was, it was a team that looked disorganized, that looked – like it wasn't confident and that was doing a lot of confusing things like starting off the game with two major runs that end up being first downs and then third and two, they're forcing a downfield throw. And then the next drive on third and three doing the same, not a lot made sense in that game. And it never seemed like for a moment that the Eagles were supposed to have been favored. I wrote a week before that at one point it was unquestionable that the Eagles were bound for the playoffs. Now it's questionable if they belong at all. They didn't look like they belonged. So that was yeah. striking to me that all of the talk leading into that from Sirianni to Jalen Hurts to everyone on the team saying that the playoffs was going to be different and that they would finally find their way through didn't show up. So they didn't have the answers. Uh, this was a very talented roster. Um, the frustrations were evident across the board, but they just simply didn't have the answers. Yeah. Yeah. You, you bring up 13 missed tackles officially, Brooks. So I look at that, and, you know, all Tampa Bay was trying to keep them in the game. If you think about all their drop passes in the first mm -hmm. half, if they caught the football, the, the game would have been over in a quicker fashion. Yeah. And then the second thing I looked at was over 11 combined on third and fourth downs. You mentioned some of the third downs of trying to – get the football down the field in manageable situations. That's been a, a problem all season. They seem to have fallen in love with the explosive play and, you know, sometimes, you know, go get the first down and get the explosive play on the next set of downs. Um, great personnel, though. And I, I raised my hand, uh, Brooks, because I thought they had great personnel. I'm starting to waver. I think Many of us overrated this team, certainly defensively, but even offensively from the perspective of no A.J. Brown. And this team looks completely different. I mean, it looks completely pedestrian when A.J. Brown wasn't on the field. Very short time. He got hurt in the first quarter in, against the Giants and then the playoffs. When he's not out there, the whole thing falls apart. Did we overrate the roster of this team? No, I don't think so because, I mean, I know this is coming from a perspective of a different team, but, you know, whenever I was covering the Texans early on in the year, going into the year, I was like, well, they don't really have any wide receivers. And the depth of what they had was like Robert Woods and Xavier Hutchinson and Brevin Jordan, all these players, and they found ways to get them open and scheme them up to be able to get catches. So, like, you make use of what you have on your roster. I mean, I was listening to you guys earlier, like, with K Quez Watkins and, um, you know, others yeah. on the receiving core. I mean, targeting them, finding them in spaces, giving them the opportunity to even get the ball. We weren't seeing that. We were seeing Jalen Hurts forcing the ball to Devontae Smith in places where it was obvious that if they were going to go to somebody, that was going to be the guy. They took all the questioning out of it for a defense. The one thing you don't want to be on offense is predictable. So on fourth and four, when in this crucial point of the game, you know, I talked to Devontae Smith after the game. He said he went up to Sirianni and said, give me the ball. Everybody in the stadium knew if they were going to go to one guy, it was going to be Devontae Smith. So if they're going to go in man-on-man -man 
situation and out out in the end zone, that's it was well covered. They they should have expected it. For him to have scored would have been totally a problem for the Buccaneers because they would have to face the question: Did you not think they were going to go to Devontae Smith there? So, I mean, I don't I don't think whenever you have Jalen Hurts, Devontae Smith, and DeAndre Swift in an offensive line that has three Pro Bowlers on it, that's a good roster in terms of the rest of the NFL. So I, that they had the lack of answers with what they had, they should have they should have been a lot more competitive offensively than they were. Brooks, I want to ask you about uh, talking to the players after the game and then with the exit interview the other day. Uh, immediately after the game, at least the, the, the whispers around the locker room, which became reports thereafter that Jason Kelsey was telling some of his teammates, listen, guys, don't know that I'm going to be back in the room. This could very well be it. Became a major conversation because of what uh, Jason Kelsey has been here during his time in Philadelphia, and I'm not suggesting it shouldn't have been the major topic of conversation, but it did just kind of take the focus away a little bit. Then on Wednesday, when all you guys get in there and the players walk it out, the question was about Sirianni and his status, starting with Jason after the game. What are you talking about? Like trying to be flippant that I don't even know why we're having this conversation and Fletcher going on deep defense of Nick Sirianni. So there have been issues that have been talked about. Are the players looking enough in the mirror and going, yeah, you know, maybe the coaching wasn't as good as it was supposed to be, but... Uh, 11 missed tackles, did you say, John, or 13? 13. 13 missed tackles. Yeah, part of that could have been because the coaches didn't have you in the optimum spot. A whole bunch of it with my eyes were, you guys didn't play hard enough. You guys didn't try hard enough. You guys weren't uh, successful enough to just put yourself into a position to make a tackle. Are the players getting less criticism than maybe they should because of Jason walking away and coaching decisions to be made? No, I, I think there's just a lot of attention on Nick Sirianni right now because of the collapse. Who is ultimately responsible? Head coach. So that's where a lot of the direction of the questioning and where things are going right now. I mean, I talked to several players, Jordan Mailata, um, you know, Nicholas Morrow, guys that were very open about how they personally and as a team struggled as players. I mean, A.J. Brown talked about it a couple of weeks ago at his locker. I mean, it's not lost out on them that their problem was as big as the coach's problem. I mean, Jalen Hurts said it as his locker okay. on Wednesday, too, that you know he included himself in the self-accountability. So I think when you look at the major problem in trying to explain why the team went from 10-1 and 1 to 11-7 and 7 down the stretch, I mean, that's a huge nosedive with a lot of questions and trying to figure out how to make it help work. But Nick Sirianni is going to take the major brunt of that. Um, that's expected. So, and the other point I'd like to make is like, if you go up to a player and say, what do you think of your coach? It's kind of a question where I, I'm not really expecting yeah, him to say anything I'm, other than, Hey, I terrible. really like the guy. Yeah, so terrible. like, I don't, I don't really expect any other answers. So I'm not saying that they don't feel that way or do feel that way, but, I don't think you're really going to get the most honest answer in that kind of situation, but you know, that's, that's just my opinion. Um, I don't think, you know, there, there are different ways to support verbally your coach and give your take on it. But I, I just psychologically and how people work, I don't think that's really, but I, situation. Will, I will say this, Barry yeah. Slay, who's as straight a shooter as you're going to get on that team did kind of suggest that the whole, flopping out to Cy for Patricia was a failure. Yeah, after uh, a decision that already been wise made. comparison. How do you deal with two wives? It's not a good thing. <laughs> so he did call out the organization, and you can direct it any way you want toward Sirianni because he says it was his decision, and or if you believe he was pushed into making the decision, I'll give Slay credit. He did uh, at least give you an honest answer that, yeah, yeah. The, the, the firing of the defense coordinator was stupid. But again, that's not, that's a that's a decision that had already been made, framed around you know a defensive coordinator shift that had already happened. Like okay, so uh, they'll tell you the truth after the fact, but they won't tell you in advance, is what you're saying. I mean, they're 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 players who have contracts and influences on this 
they have futures their futures so if they're they're accountable to what their problems are too they're going to throw themselves under the bus too like you know what if I, there, there are some things that aren't really smart to do you know I, yeah. I, so it's well i yeah. say it all the time people listen to coaches in press conference brooks and they act like they're under oath i mean they lie to us all the time nick seriani yeah. lied but you know people say oh he said this on Monday. Yeah, you might have been right. blowing smoke up here. You know, Sirianni what? said, you know, on a Monday that he wasn't going to change play callers or defensive play callers, yeah. and then two days later, Sean, uh, Matt Patricia is leading the yeah. defensive meetings. So, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you're a hundred percent right on that. But I want to, you know, let's talk about Nick Sirianni because that's the story, obviously. And scheduled meeting today with Jeffrey Laurie. So we know Jeffrey's history here in Philadelphia. And, um, we know the six out of seven, it, it looked really bad at the end, the optics. Now to me, you have a very unique viewpoint of this because you were in Houston. And if you think about Houston in the wake of Bill O'Brien, I, I think it was, what'd they go? Three straight years. I think it was Romeo, David Cully, Lovey Smith. And then they finally seem to have gotten it right with D'Amico Ryans. But, um, there were some lean times in, in, in Houston and they didn't have the greatest reputation because they're hiring guys to fire them in one year. Um, where do you kind of fall on continuity versus um, uh, this guy's got a 667 winning percentage, three consecutive playoff appearances, but it looked really bad. You want to be rash? You want to reboot where you believe in continuity? So, you know, we could go for an hour about the coaching changes over the last three years with the Texans. There are a lot of stories to that. Uh, but specific to um, this situation, the difference here is you look at a Texans organization that was constantly rebuilding and drafting new players and bringing in young free agents and working with the cap situation that was absolutely garbage. And that needed to be overhauled. So whenever the coaches were in those situations and coming out of uh, Bill O'Brien's firing, Romeo Cornell was the interim for that year. And then they started opening up and then uh, Deshaun Watson uh, issued a trade demand and then was hit with all of his civil lawsuits. Nobody was really going to at the, at the, at the trade demand, nobody really wanted to come into that situation. So the job pool was pretty slim. And David Cauley became the head coach first time as an NFL head coach. After that, the roster was still in shambles um, after that first year. And the reason partly why David Cauley was fired was because the players that they were drafting and putting in these situations were not being developed. You think about the offense and whether it's fitting the defense, whether it's fitting is everything that's being put into this organization. Is that working? So that's the point that I'd make through this. Right now, Nick Sirianni and Howie Roseman making calls all week, looking for coaches available to present and a potential staff to um, Jeffrey Lurie. So the main question here is you've got two scenarios that are probably going to happen. Right now, offensive coordinator Brian Johnson's out interviewing for head coaching positions. So let's just say you're going to either, one, start over entirely by firing Nick Sirianni and – hiring a new head coach to build out a staff or you believe in Nick Sirianni and he's going to pretty much have the same effect from there on down in the coaching staff that would happen with an entire overhaul anyway new coordinators likely a lot of new staff members below that so do they believe that Sirianni does Jeffrey Lurie believe that Sirianni is the one that will be able to lead a coaching staff into new answers or those people that are coming in going to be the ones that can solve the answers for why they went from 10 and one to 11 and seven, why the offense that had all these players couldn't find a way to get downfield and score, why AJ Brown wasn't able to be involved in the games. He was why Jalen hurts couldn't handle the blitz, why the defense, you know, couldn't tackle and couldn't be in space. Those guys will be part of that. And Lurie would have to have confidence that a, he can, Sirianni can find those people and B, organize the team and all of the things that go off the field in terms of organization, although that would be part of the same flow with the players that they have. So 
that's that's the major question. So right now, this is totally different from what the Texans had the last three years. You have a team that had high expectations, the roster that's prepared. You're looking to see, is this something that can – teams have seen what you're going to do. They, uh, Jalen Hurts and this offense, and they found answers against you. Now you're trying to figure out whether you have the guys that are going to be able to respond. Totally different situation. So uh, it's what the Texans next year are going to have to deal with when everybody says – well, we looked at this one year with C.J. Stroud and Nico Collins and all these people and Bobby Sloak with all of his offense. They're going to find answers for it. They're going to come next year. And if they struggle, then that's what the Eagles situation would be in right now. So those are the differences. All right. John and I discussed it in the first segment today and yesterday. And Ed Kratz, when he jumped in with us, we discussed it with him. And we all seem to be pretty much on the same side. If there's a change in head coach uh, late today, tomorrow, whatever – next couple of days, it'll be because Nick Sirianni got himself fired, that he drew a line in the sand, that he refused to walk back, and that Jeff Floyd decided to pull the plug on him. I think he's smart enough to realize that and won't do that. But the reason I can't say 100% is because, A, I think he can be real stubborn. And from time to time, he lets his emotions get the better of him. Give me a percentage chance that Nick either takes a stance or, or reacts to something that he's told or, or is asked to react to where he just gets crazy and pointing fingers and screaming and yelling at fans and going into tunnels and screaming at the. Is there any chance Nick Sirianni shoots himself in the foot this afternoon? I would be thinking about what he would be taking his stand on. Um, because when you sit down and you're in that meeting, I, I'll give you I'll give you a name, Kevin Petulo. If the word comes down today, listen, here are the we got the coaching staff list here, and we're just scratching off names, and one of them's Kevin Petulo, his good buddy, his trusted number one ear. If they say, Listen, we're wiping all this clean, and you got to be okay with it, Nick. Would Nick go to war for him? When I mean, they're making several calls throughout this week, organizing as potential staffs so that they can look through and see which is going to make this happen. So it's not just one name. So that already is not, I don't think, the case. So I I think in the certain situations where he'd be maybe inflexible is not the right word because he the what the thing I keep thinking about in terms of what he really really believes in and is not really, it's he's always said like this is my offense this is what we're running through, um, but even then, I think he's savvy enough to know that they didn't have the right answers for the blitz they didn't have the right answers for how how things work getting the ball downfield to their best receivers how some of that didn't work so. It's his his rhetoric throughout all these games has been, you know, we're trying, we're a solutions based team. We're not pointing fingers. And the fact that he on defense presumptuous, pre, uh, presumptuous, uh, I mean, I think he maybe was a little too soon in uh, shifting from Sean to side to Matt Patricia. Basically, that proved out by the defense not doing any better, but that showed that he was willing to change even at a time when he wasn't really supposed to. I mean, I think he's pretty aware of how he ended up getting the job with the Eagles where Doug Peterson goes in and is obstinate and doesn't want to really change beyond what he thinks should happen. And it was already bucking with personnel and, you know, was, had, was very loyal to his coaching staff. I think Sirianni knows a little bit how to read the room in that type of way. Okay. So I, uh, I would be surprised if that was the case, if he ended up, you know, dying on a hill. Fair point. Um, you, you mentioned blitz a couple of times, and that was the biggest problem, I think, offensively. People and Jason Kelsey even said it on clean out day. Whether Jason Kelsey's back or not, and it's unlikely he's coming back, Jalen Hurts is going to see a lot of zero blitz until he proves he can handle it, and this coaching staff can help him handle it. How much of the issues lean on the quarterback? in those types of situations. I mean, think about the term site yeah. adjustment, uh, Brooks. It's in the offense. I've seen it. But that's a, a site. That's a receiver 
and a quarterback being on the same page. There's an unblocked. That's on the quarterback. Date, dating back to Frank Reich, what Eagles fans love, and Shane Steichen. An unaccounted for blitzer is essentially that's on the quarterback. Everybody's got their responsibility to pick up. If you have an extra guy coming, ball's got to come out. How much do you blame that on Jalen Hurts? Um, I mean, he's definitely a huge part of it. Um, you have certain situations where the coach is supposed to give you an answer, and then there's the player who's supposed to recognize it and then respond with the right answer. And, I mean, even it, with the safety, that's a four-man rush, and he ends up taking a safety after getting flagged for intentional grounding. There was a lot of times, I'm thinking back to even, I believe it was the Cowboys game, correct me if I'm wrong, where they were driving into the uh, end zone, uh, into the red zone, and then he backed up and then slipped and fell. And then that turned into a field goal that was not helpful in the game. There were times where he was running himself into pressure. There was time he was running away from answers that were on the field. Um, a lot of the times he pulls off towards a sideline and the receiver that looks to be the hot route is on the other side of the field. Um, there's, it, it becomes part of a larger conversation too about the responsibility Jalen Hurts had throughout the year that Brian Johnson, Nick Sirianni were trying to do and giving him more power at the line. He walked up to the line of scrimmage with a list of checks that he could go to in a play. Some offenses, you only get one under certain coaches. Uh, he had a list. And there were times where I feel like there was clear miscommunication for what they were doing. We got an insight on that against Tampa Bay on Monday night where the third and three, he gives one check that looked like this. And then yeah. right at the end, well, he did yeah. a little little quick this, and nobody was looking. You know, Devontae Smith said that later. Him and De Dallas Goddard saw the first sign, didn't see the second. And now they're running pretty much the same route. Yeah. And, yeah, making things a problem. That's on Jalen. That's on the players too. For are they supposed to be looking the whole time? Is he is Jalen supposed to be more demonstrative? I mean, it is on the players in those senses. Whenever you're given the power to dictate what can happen on the line, you you got to make sure that communication is being heard. So if that stems over, because we don't have examples, it's it's great when players tell you what's going on because then you can understand a bit. I don't. I haven't talked to any. I went through the locker room the other day and um, tried to understand a little bit about the blitzes and whether there's some specific examples to look to. Um, you know, talking to a couple offensive linemen, and all these players are accepting the blame as a whole. Um, you know, they are like, "Well, look, you can look at the field and you see that the defense has one free player. Sometimes it comes from anywhere, and they can have one player from the box go take off and then cover somebody else on the other side of the field." So. All of the conversations I had basically pointed to it's been difficult for the offense to diagnose who people are sending, given the offense that they're running. So the checks, all that stuff, they've it, it hasn't really worked in terms of giving Hertz the ability to check through those things. So that's things that they really need the 30 foot view for to reassess whether that system even functions well and how they can fix that to allow Hertz to have the right way to check the things, to see things the right way, and to not end up in situations where they have no answers. So, um, yeah, that, that it's, a, it's, it's definitely, there's definitely a lot of the weight of that issue on, on, on Jalen and the players, for sure. Since you made reference earlier to uh, the Texan situation and the positions they were in, and Sari Capel because of Deshaun Watson and the deal they were going to have to make to get him off the roster. I know you get the whole roster construction thing. One of the most intriguing guys this offseason to me is, because the Eagles got a whole bunch of free agents. Whole guys just after they finish the game in Tampa, oops, guess what? You're not an Eagle anymore. You're a free agent. Are you coming back? You're going elsewhere or whatever. Well, one guy they have under contract going forward that I have no bloody idea what you can expect from him, or if they just have to move on. James Bradbury signed a three-year contract during this past offseason. You can move on from a guy anytime you want, but there are ramifications and salary cap hits. And his would be in excess of $17 million, which is a lot less than you'd be paying him just to have him back, but because you spread money out and you went three years deep. That's a pretty good hit for a guy who you kept all of one year and he stunk. 
What do you think they're going to do with James Bradbury? Did they swallow the pill and go, yeah, he just fell off the face of the earth as far as talent and skill and not believe that it was a coaching issue that he just got real old, real fast. What do you think they're going to do with James Bradbury this off season? Yeah, you're right. I mean, when it comes to dead money, um, he'd end up being a major hit costing the team close to $10 million in terms of cap savings. The only way that doesn't change according to over the cap is if he's traded post June 1st, and that would give them alleviation um, on, on the salary cap. Also, according to this after post after June 1st, if he's cut his dead money goes down to 4 million and then he'd be as pretty much a nominal cap savings. So they, they have some leeway a little bit with this contract and according to over the cap, which is generally uh, accurate on these things. Mm -hmm. So keeping him through training camp and then making a decision through there, they'd have a lot more financial, um, flexibility in deciding where they want to keep him or not. So going into the off season, I would expect that they look at that position really hard. Um, and you've got players like Keely Ringo who came in and played a lot and at times struggled at times looked like he excelled and they decide whether they need to add more to that group. I think they do um, throughout all the problems they had at the slot beyond Devante Maddox. And you got to, decide what you're going to do. Bradley Roby, his contract is expiring. Uh, was he just a mercenary for this year? You'd have to probably replace that roster spot. Um, so they pull together and figure out how to bolster up that defensive back core and then move into training camp, knowing that whatever they have behind that, if they decide to move on from Bradbury, whoever they have is going to be good enough to replace him. So is that building around Ringo? Is that building around whatever? You know, that's, that's definitely something they will do in in my opinion so uh, as 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 bleak as his contract is currently there there appears to be more flexibility in the future at b cabina follow brooks on x uh twitter whatever you want to call it athletic uh dot com does a tremendous job covering the philadelphia eagles your first clean out day in philadelphia brooks the most interesting part to me was fletcher cox for two reasons one Fletcher empties the locker, said he needed to clean it. That's not a typical way of doing business. You see some of those guys, those mercenaries. Shaq Leonard, it wasn't even a speck of dust to yeah. tell you he was there. Yeah. Um, and it got so, Nick Morrow out quickly. Um, Marcus Mariota, bang, everything gone. Fletcher, that's weird. And then to, to add to that, Jordan Davis was talking about him like he was gone. What, in in the past tense, and he and Jalen Carter have to step up. They're not going to have Fletcher Cox as the security blanket. Is that just a young player just making speculation? Is it wild? Do you think there was more to it? Yeah, um, I think, well, for one, um, you know, Dave Zangaro, he asked him to clarify whether they actually talked to him or not about their decision of Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham, and he admitted that they did not. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's partly a young guy reading the tea leaves and that's not to stay like whenever older veterans come up and start talking to you and there's <clears> a, a sense of what they're saying and they're saying, Hey, this is in your hands, you know, like whatever, all these kinds of different ways. And those aren't specific quotes, but I'm gathering that they've been talking to him in the way that, you know, the defensive staff have wanted them to take these young draft picks, these young first round picks and teach them up to give them the leadership that you've had and uh, give them the lessons. That's a thing that Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox both have done. So, um, you know, this situation, I think definitely from Jordan Davis perspective, he's just a young guy reading the tea leaves. I don't think he has the, the, the direct knowledge of that, but at the same time, um, you look at Cox and Graham and, you know, their contracts are up. Um, you look at the performance and where the defense is going. They're really going to have to figure out what fit um, everybody fits into whenever they ultimately figure out what defensive coach is going to lead this team. I think Fletcher Cox still has, you know, I think it'd be up. I think, it, I think the Eagles would allow 
Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham for as much as they've done with the team to decide whether, um, you know, they, they'd be able to, uh, make a case to come back. So I think there were a lot of times where Fletcher played really well. So I think he'd be a fit elsewhere. So it's really, to me, it would be a question of whether, um, you know, Cox wants to come back. So those are things that whenever you talk to him in his locker, him saying, I haven't really made the decision yet. Um, I think that, that, I think that's more the lines of where that is. So, um, Brand Grimm made clear after the game Sunday that he wants to come back for yeah. homecoming. Um, you know, he's played throughout the year, um, you know, just coming in halfway through, seeing that the Eagles and their pass rush wasn't what it was the last year. That would be just a large conversation for the Eagles to say, is is the roster spot from Brandon Graham going into this? Is that is, is he going to be effective in whatever scheme they end up running? So um, <laughs> it's not – hopefully it's not Matt – Patricia or some other kind of coach that's bringing edge rushers back in coverage like they were doing with Brandon Graham so much. So um, we'll, we'll see. No, I think we're 99.9% .9 sure it's not going to be Matt <laughs> Patricia running the defense next year. All right, Brooks, last thing. Where'd you get the jacket slash sweater or whatever it is that you got? Look, look at a little texas -y, but I think yeah. it's going to work in Philadelphia. Where'd you get that? Oh, it was a gift. It was a gift. It's just uh, just a cardigan. Um, just a, it was a thoughtful thing from someone I know, and because they're like, well, it's a little colder out there, so I'm yeah. actually I'm actually kind of coming down, like, yeah, with a little bit of a little bit of a cold myself. Uh oh, and, uh, you're my, probably my, too close to Martin. Uh, my, you know, well, uh, my my car was uh, covered in snow yesterday, yeah. like ice, everything. I had to take out and pretty much. I should have tried to get Cam Jurgens' flamethrower. <laughs> so, um, definitely definitely new around here uh you got the cardigan on you're looking good i don't know if it's yeah, gonna actually good. save you from getting a cold but you look good my friend and we appreciate you jumping in with us today thank you very much we'll talk to you plenty during the off season thanks for joining us today of course see you guys brooks thanks, Cabina from the athletic uh if you don't subscribe to the athletic you might think about it because he does an outstanding job <clears throat> covering the birds. And he jumped in mid-season and he hit the ground running. Uh, did a really nice job this year. Did a good job with us today. All right, McMullen and McDonald coming back. We got to put a bow on the show, a bow on the weekend. And we'll just give you a little shot in the dark as to what's going to happen with the Eagles this upcoming next couple of days. A little speculation to go out the door here on Birds 365.